Well, welcome everybody to the latest episode of Star Cells and God. This is the show where we discuss the new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science and explore how these discoveries provide evidence for God's existence, God's nature, and the reliability of Scripture. My name is Fuzz Rana. I'm a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I'm joined in studio today by Dr. Jeff Zwerink, who is an astrophysicist and a Christian apologist as well. We both work for an organization called Reasons to Believe. If you want to know more about Reasons to Believe, go to our website, www.reasons.org. Also, you can follow us on social media, rtb underscore official. And then don't forget to go to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe, where you can gain access to all kinds of great video content that explores a wide range of questions relating to science and the Christian faith. And while you're there, make sure you use the notification button so that you can be alerted when the next episode of Star Cells and God drops. Okay, well, without any further messing around, uh, Jeff, why don't we go ahead and get started today with, uh, with uh, your discussion of, of, I guess, AI and, and AI's use in science. Well, it is, and I, I've just noticed there's an increasingly large number of papers about how AI is being used in science. And I, you know, I just kind of picked out three that I thought were interesting uh, because they raised a bigger question, and that, and that bigger question was the discussion I went ahead today. But one of the things that they've been using AI to do, <clears throat> or that they found they could do with AI, is that they're exploring whether chat GPT, for all the rancor that causes and how it's going to play out in education, one of the things chat GPT is good at recognizing or good at analyzing is uh, language patterns. And, and I'm going to use that term kind of loosely because it's actually analyzing input and output, not language, if you will. But the thought was maybe they could use the AI behind ChatGPT to actually detect uh, Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia early mm -hmm. because often where Alzheimer's starts showing up or one of the places where it shows up is uh, odd speech patterns. And so by having an AI that is familiar with your speech patterns, mm -hmm. presumably it could start to or notice earlier than otherwise that maybe Alzheimer's was setting on. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, another AI that they did was, or, and I forget the name of them, but uh, where it was looking at protein folding. And, you know, yeah. they built this humongous database of protein folds. I think it was like 53 million, if I remember correctly. But what they did then is they you know, kind of set the AI on it and said, what else can, what else, you know, what, what other patterns, what other, go, what other, uh, structures might be found here. And what the AI found in looking through this enormous database was, uh, you know, 290 different families of proteins, but they actually found a unique protein fold that hadn't been seen anywhere. And uh, I, I think the they were able to go synthesize that afterwards. But it just has this sense, or there's this growing number of fields where there's just more data than what any person can look at. Uh, it seems like, you know, if you couple the chat GPT where you can query with a question or say, hey, go do, um, then this AI can now go off and kind of, in some sense, do the research for you. And, and mm. that's, you can kind of see the question I'm going at is, you know, will AI ever actually be able to do science? Uh, because another, the, the third one, and I'm going to spend a little time on because I just thought this one was cool. It has different or different places or a number of different interesting implications was uh, using an AI that would look at the output of a particular type of instrumentation. And this instrumentation, you take a sample, you put it through, you know, pyrolysis, gas, chroma, gas chromatograph, get the spectrum out, and then you also put it through a mass spec to get the masses of the mm -hmm. uh, materials that are in the sample. And then they trained this AI on a bunch of laboratory grade reagents and various uh, substances. And then the AI was able to distinguish biotic versus abiotic origin of uh, mm -hmm. uh, just a, a number of random samples. And in particular, what was interesting is that it was designed to find the distinction between biotic and abiotic but it seemed to come up, or it came up with this third class, which was, uh, you know, the, the term I use for it is fossil biotic. So it's not, it's produced by biological organisms, but 
from a long time ago. So it's just got three different mm -hmm. characteristics. And the idea behind that was not what are the chemical compounds that are going to be present if life is there, but it's just saying, hey, life operates differently than non-life. If we train you know, train AIs to look at life and non-life or, or uh, substances, they ought to be able to detect it. And again, it's finding all of these correlations that very often the data sets are just so massive that humans can't see because it just takes a massive amount of data to do it. And, you know, I thought that was interesting because they've got these uh, missions where we're going to launch something that'll go to Mars and yeah, I think there's a sample uh, sample analysis instrument or, uh, on Mars instrument where it's not exactly like the paralysis GC with the mass spec after it. But you know, you could imagine doing that with any sort of right. instrumentation you could put there and say, all right, here's the data you're going to get, train it before it goes, and then it can just in situ do mm -hmm. the analysis. And like I said, it just kind of raises this question in my mind: Will AIs? eventually do science because uh, yeah. they're starting to do granted human driven but a lot of the things that humans have done uh, you know yeah. finding protein folds novel classes of things just by being able to search the literature and that's at least one function of a scientist is to search the literature and synthesize new right. ideas or hey maybe this is the way to go so i'm, not, I'm just going to throw that question to you i'm curious how you would respond will ai ever be able to do science in the way we're talking about, and if it can't, why not? Yeah, well, because it, it seems to me, and, it, and maybe this is a bit repetitive as a point, that what AI is doing in all these examples is sifting through a vast amount of data that would be impossible for a human or a team of mm -hmm. humans to, to, to sift through and identify patterns, you know, where you, you in a sense, have a, a complex collection of variables, and the AI is able to identify those patterns that correlate mm -hmm. with variables and because of that is able to create distinct categories. Uh, that seems to me what's happening. And in fact, I think you were on the show with me when we talked about using machine learning, which is kind of a proto AI mm -hmm. to actually determine whether a hominin burial was intentional or, you know, so we could add I that. I have to add that to my class of examples yeah. here. Yeah. You're right. You know, no, I do you know, remember that discussion. Yeah. You know, so, you know, so to me as a scientist, I'm very excited about AI having that capability, mm -hmm. right, to, to uh, be able to do, again, classifications or categorizations with very complex sets of data mm -hmm. in, in a meaningful way, right? Um, but it seems to me that science is oftentimes as much about postulating an explanation, formulating mm -hmm. a hypothesis, developing tests for that hypothesis, you know, what really oftentimes characterizes advance in science would be those people that are, incre that are creative in terms of mm -hmm. uh, how they go about, in, in, you know, addressing a problem or asking a question mm -hmm. or interrogating the data, uh, you know, where it's out-of-the-box thinking Mm -hmm. you know, or they, they are seeing connections that other people don't see. I don't know that, that AI is at the point where it could formulate a hypothesis and then devise a test, but it might, mm -hmm. maybe if you trained it in the right way. I don't know. But that, to me, is science. Well, and that's kind of the question, and, it, and it's less about where it is now, because I agree it's nowhere in that class of right. being able to do that. But it, it kind of got me thinking how much of science is an algorithm we're following, uh, mm -hmm. You know, and that it's okay. You identify a problem, you post, you know, put put forth a, a tentative explanation or what you think might be going on. You ask how can you go out and test that. You devise a test, and then you go perform the test and see did it did it a did it match? How does it weigh in on whether your your explanation was correct? And it seems to me there is a very algorithmic nature of that, that if you were, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in my optimistic pie in the sky, let's look at it. You know, imagine if you could, you know, you have, you know, Einstein and Newton and, you know, wh whatever genius scientists you want to put in that class have described, here's what I did, here's how I thought about it, here's the question I asked. That now becomes data that an AI could mine in principle to figure out, you know, 
if you could ask the question, right. now can you, could you devise that, oh, you know, could the AI not only say, okay, here's the types of, or here's the thought, or here's the patterns that go into the questions that often lead to, or how to devise. I, mean, I could see in principle that might happen. Yeah. I think the part that I struggle with is that every time I've seen AI attempted to be used in my field of, you know, high energy astrophysics, Typically, it's going in, you know, we've got simulations, this vast wealth of simulation data, we're trying to find gamma rays or dark matter particles, and we're doing simulations, and we're saying, all right, we can simulate all this, and we can use AI to train it on that data, and then you go look at the data. And there's all always, the more you look at the simulations with the AI, there's this great promise that the, the machine learning or whatever the terminology, the neural networks are going to do better than what we could do. And it never does. And... My explanation for that is in part or large part is like we're always simulate or our simulations are always limited by what our data is. Right. We say, okay, we've got this data, we need to be able to simulate this data. So the AI is going finding correlations beyond that, but we're almost always taking shortcuts because to simulate the actual data is so time intensive we can't. So the simulations match the data that we have, but they don't have all of the other data, you know, the background stuff that the AI presumably would be able to find correlations with. And so that's why it never works. It's always the, the simulations are only as good as our current data. Our AI can't produce new data. And so therefore, it's, it's mm. always stuck at the level of what we know. Yeah. I'm inclined to think that's the way it's going to play out in science, mm. just in general. I mean, yeah. we can add more and more tools. I mean, it used to be you hired people to do calculations because you couldn't, or then you had computers do it. And so we've, I could see it being a very integral tool that we use in doing science. Yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to agree with you that there's something creative about going on there that goes beyond the, this is what we know to right. this is what might be. But AI could be a tool to help facilitate the development of a hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you are dealing with a very complex system, you might naively go in and, and, and posit an explanation for what's going on or a series of tests. But if AI is able to recognize patterns in the data that a human wouldn't necessarily be able to mm -hmm. recognize, that might help to formulate maybe a more sophisticated or a uh, uh, a more insightful hypothesis about right, what's yeah. going on, or you, you could see, I could see AI as even being a tool in designing, helping to design an experiment, mm -hmm. you know, when you're dealing with complex systems. Well, and that's particularly a place, uh, you know, chat GPT is largely trained on just the internet of data, but I could imagine if you were to take an AI, and I, I think probably maybe even field specific might help in some ways, although you'd want to branch out because often it's the collaboration of fields that can lead insight into what's going on. But if you could just train it on the scientific literature, you know, that would, you, you would be in essence training it in think, in the way people think. You know, again, I think it's reflecting the way people think. It isn't actually thinking that way. But I could see it being a very powerful tool of just saying, oh, this, in, in essence saying, oh, this has already been done. Yeah. Or this these this group of people did this experiment and it showed this because, you know, try as you might, you just can't keep up with the scientific literature even in your own discipline anymore. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But I do think, I mean, I, I've, I, I, it's hard to have these discussions without sounding either like a Luddite or, a, you know, a Pollyanna eye in, pie in the sky, everything's going to work yeah. out all right. But I do think AI has this great capacity. It's got the potential to infringe on rather than science being, oh, this place where AI is never going to get there or never going to touch, I think it does have the capacity to touch in there uh, yeah. because there's a lot of science that is, I don't, I don't want to say repetitive, I'm not sure how to say that in a not derogatory or pejorative way, but where people are doing stuff that could be systematized and done by yeah. computers, if you will. Yeah. But I, I do think there's something that humans bring to that game that until yeah. AI achieves some sort of sentience, the AI is never going to bring to that game. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of the discussion about AI uh, today is a, about generative AI, mm -hmm. where AI, you know, is it going to take the place of a poet, of, of writers, <laughs> of artists, right? You know, and here's another situation where, 
you know, you ask the question, is AI going to take the place of, of scientists, <laughs> right? You know, and, and maybe even technologists, you know, so those questions I think are, are disturbing to a lot of people. They're disturbing to me because mm-hmm. I see, you know, creativity, not only in, in art, but in, in science is really being defining of who we are as human beings, our, mm-hmm. our creative spirit, our, our capacity to create. So that to me is where I feel uncomfortable with AI <laughs> in, in that, you know, could AI make humans irrelevant, mm-hmm. right? I, I think using AI to, you know, replace mundane tasks or to search through data mm-hmm. that we would have no hope of discerning. I think right. as a tool, AI is a wonderful thing. I'm very excited about it, you know, and there are probably a lot of applications for mm-hmm. AI that we haven't even thought of that would be, right. you know, exciting and, and could, you know, just make the world a better place. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's that fine line between when are you actually replacing the, the essence of, of human activity with just the, the repetitive nature of human activity. Well, and, and you know, I just, I was thinking of a conversation I've had with a fellow who I know who's, you know, creative, you know, likes writing and music and, and that sort of stuff. And, and a comment he made, I think is interesting, that I think there's, you know, if you look at the music scene today, there's what's popular, which I think you could make an argument is largely derivative. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think you could write an AI or make an AI that could produce music like that because yeah. there are things that are popular and all you have to do is sort out that and then reproduce it. And I think, okay, that, that's... But there are also people who are just creative. I mean, you know, I, I don't know a ton in the music, but I think you know, Bob Dylan had that kind of... You know, he wasn't the just run of the mill. There was something mm-hmm. new he was doing. I mean, mm-hmm. it's Louis Armstrong. I mean, you know, there are these people who just did something new yeah. And I don't think AI will ever replace that. It, yeah. it may contribute or help or throw you know, the occasional quote unquote suggestion. Right. Uh, but I do think we may, we may be able to replicate the popular part of anything, but the actual essence of what you're doing, yeah. you know, the truly creative, genuine, I, I don't yeah. think that's ever going to, AI is ever going to get there. Although it's going to be a tool to help us do that better. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th- I think there's some troubling things about this, but it also, in a very real way, I think is going to illuminate the difference between a machine and a person. Yeah. If we're, mm-hmm. if we're keen to the, if we're keen to pay attention to that, if we mm-hmm. just attribute it as, oh, that's human, we're going to miss that. I think. But. Oh, that's a really interesting point. That, yeah, that that AI may actually highlight really what makes us mm-hmm. exceptional as human beings. You know, which could be a, an unexpected benefit of, of AI, I guess. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, wow, that's that's a lot of fun. I appreciate all the the work that you do to just keep abreast of what's happening with with AI. It's I'm sure uh, like running uh, up a, a down moving escalator or running down an up moving escalator or whatever. It, it, well, it just it's in so many different areas, so it is hard. But the Honestly, the key rec- once I got to this recognition that there's a whole lot of things we're doing that are, you know, just kind of pattern recognition in out. And so it's if if you got this, are we doing this? Is it sentient? If that question is being asked, this all becomes very muddied. But once I realized there's a very what we're doing now isn't in the sentient class. It's it's very much task specific and it's like so once i kind of got the categories it became much easier to think and see how to incorporate new right. new data and because i mean like i said i mean you've got biology you know proteins you've got uh looking for life you've got alzheimer's you've got uh you know looking for exoplanets yeah it's the same algorithm same sort of process just yeah. played out in different fashions and so yeah. but yeah it, it is a lot of work i gotta admit that so yeah all right, well, let me go ahead and uh, sh- shift gears, if that's okay. And just to ease us into the discussion I want to have about xenotransplantation, uh, <laughs> I just uh, want to ask you a question, and that is, uh, what would be the superpower that you would choose if you could choose any potential superpower, right? So here's just a few examples of, of, of superpowers. And I- I've actually given a lot of thought to this question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> You know, it's so. Is that last one say parents? It does. Parents. <laughs> I think. I think it's. Oh, okay. 
parents are superheroes got. Yeah. If I want to be hokey, that's I would say that probably most closely aligns <laughs> with what I want. Um, I'm going to have to go with psychokinesis. I mean, yeah. that would be kind of cool. I would see, you know, immor immortal would be nice, but I don't want to live forever here. So yeah, um, I could see, yeah, I would see troubles with invisible uh, psychic. I don't know that I want to know what everybody's thinking. Flight, I got to admit, flight would be cool. Yeah. I, flight or psychokinesis. Yeah. Maybe if I'm psychokinetic, I can make myself fly. So maybe I'll go with that one. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because I would have uh, probably chosen psychokinesis too. You know, as, really? as a chemist, I think it would be really cool to be able to make molecules <laughs> do whatever I want them to do. And I, I discovered that there's actually a, a villain, a super villain in the Marvel Universe called Molecule Man oh, really? that can do that very thing. So, you know, uh, anyway. But that, but well, that, so isn't that Jack-Jack in uh, The Incredibles? Doesn't he have psychokinesis of some sort? You know, I think so. He can so. change structure of himself. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, 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 the reason I bring this up is because, you know, there's a lot of excitement these days about the whole superhero phenomena, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, you know, we recognize there's a lot of reasons, I think, why su the superhero stories are popular. Um, and I'm not going to get into what my why I think that's the case. Uh, but, you know, the bottom line is that at the end of the day, superheroes are savior like figures. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking for heroes, we're looking for people who will save us. And of course, we recognize that there's a lot of real life heroes, right? They may not have superpowers, but these are people who are saviors of sorts, right? That they, you know, well, for example, people that are uh, part of an emergency response, oh, okay. All right. gotcha. police officers, firefighters, mm -hmm. you know, paramedics, as an example, you might even say teachers. These are people that are self-sacrificial gotcha. and they're, okay. they're, they're doing things for the, the betterment of the community. And, and so, you know, that's, so the idea is to help and, you know, whatever dilemma problem somebody's in to you know to save them from that if you will so. yeah yeah and and you're doing it without regard for your <sighs> your own safety your own mm -hmm. concerns and there's a group of people that I want to acknowledge as what I think to be heroes and those are people who volunteer to be part of medical studies okay right you know people that take part in clinicals where experimental medical procedures or drugs are being Eva evaluated. A lot of times these people are motivated to do this because they're suffering from a disease and mm -hmm. there's not really a lot of options. But in, in many respects, what they're doing is, is sacrificial, that they mm -hmm. are willing to be, you know, to subject themselves to ex human experimentation in order to learn something that could benefit people, you know, in mm -hmm. the future in countless number of people. And along those lines, there's a, another group of people that, you know, again, are heroes, and those would be people that donate their bodies to medical science. Okay. Right. And, this is like after they've passed away. Right. People can study it, use organs, that sort of stuff. So. Right, right. And uh, and there's a person that, that exemplifies this, and this is a picture of a, of a guy named Maurice Mo Williams who died maybe about three months ago now uh, from brain cancer. Mm. And he was actually an organ donor, but because he had brain cancer, his organs weren't useful, oh, okay. you know, for donation. And so uh, a team of medical uh, researchers at New York University, Lang Langone, I think is how you pronounce it, Health Center, approached his family and asked would they be willing to donate his body uh, to an experimental, uh, pr uh, an experimental study hmm, okay. uh, in which these researchers are taking patients that are brain dead, removing their kidneys and replacing them with kidneys from genetically modified pigs okay. as a way to determine whether or not those kidneys would perform uh, in a human, in a human, you know, in a human. Okay. Right. And so, uh, you know, the, the, there's some interesting articles about his family really wrestling with this question. Would they be willing to donate his body, you know, for experimental purposes? Yeah, that, uh, that does have an odd flavor to it because they're kind of keeping the physical processes alive. Uh, yeah, that is an odd right. ethical question to ask in there. So. Right. Well, and, and the thing is there's a difference between a patient that's brain dead versus a patient that's vegetative. Yes. A, a vegetative so. patient could potentially right, yeah. gain consciousness. A brain dead patient is dead. Right. And they're keeping that the body alive right. with the medical technology. But, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing, you know, because mm -hmm. you no recognize – 
that as family members, you're delaying the grieving process, you know, or yeah. you're, you're pro, you know, prolonging that process. And you, you that individual's remains are being, you know, mutilated to some yeah, degree, right. right? And so anyway, uh, this team at New York University uh, in the f- summer of 2022 did the first ever uh, uh, xenotransplantation where they took a kidney from a pig and transplanted it into a brain dead patient okay. just to see if the, if the, the brain dead patient's body would accept the kidney. Okay. You know, and then after two days, they, they shut down the experiment. This time, they extended the experiment for two months hmm. to see if the kidney would perf- continue to function for a protracted period of time. Okay. And so presumably the initial test had some sort of success that prompted yes, the, the longer right, study. So. Right. And so, the, and so they ended up extending it for two months successfully. There was a point in the middle of that that experiment where the kidney began to fail mm-hmm. and they were able to adjust medication mm-hmm. and recover the kidney function, reverse the, wow. the failure process. So this is really exciting because this is an, exp- an experiment that is a stepping stone to moving the use of pig organs mm-hmm. in, in humans into a clinical, into small scale clinical studies. So, it, so presumably the, the end goal or the hope or thought is that if at some point we can take organs from like pigs to right. deal with kidney failure, if you can deal with the rejection issue, if you can make them work, right. then you now no longer have to be on the wait list. Yep. You can just have the organ kind of ready, almost ready because right. pigs can be, you know, the organs can be harvested as needed. So. Right. And in, in, interesting you say that because the, the reason why people are doing this, these odd experiments that might be troubling to people is there's an organ shortage, yeah. right? You know, um, I've seen different figures, but it's somewhere between 100 to 200,000 people are waiting currently uh, for organs for right. for transplant, wow. and most of those people are going to die without having an organ available to right. them. And so the, the thought is that if you could use animals as a source of organs for humans, mm-hmm. that you could at least create a bridge that keep those people alive long enough for, to receive an organ, or maybe it becomes, you know, a permanent part of them. But kidneys are the number one organ that people are waiting on. Interesting. And, and, uh, the, the next are livers and then and then hearts, uh, you know, are about our third on the right. list. And it turns out that that pigs have a physiology that makes them ideally suited as organ donors for uh, for humans. And so people are looking at not only uh, lungs as a as a not sorry, check that kidneys as a, a source of organs mm-hmm. from pigs. But they're also looking at hearts as okay. well. Pig hearts. Um and in fact, one, one would think God would have made some other animal to be closer. That just yeah. that doesn't put us real high on the list. There. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've thought about that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but but you know, there's a, a a team at the University of Maryland that has actually done two uh, pig pig heart to human transplants. Hmm. Um, in 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 both instances, the patients were basically terminal. Okay. Uh, they were not eligible for transplants, so mm-hmm. you know, game was game over basically. Yeah. And so, about a, I think last summer, a, a team from Maryland um, did a, a trans a pig to human transplant. The patient lived for two months and then died. Nobody's quite certain what what the cause of death was. There okay. was something that went wrong with the transplant. Uh, but they've now just done another procedure mm-hmm. within a, within the last few weeks on a second patient mm-hmm. in a similar predicament, and so that right. experiment is is still ongoing. Hmm. You know, so uh, you know this is uh, on the cusp of, of becoming a reality. Right. And the idea of using animal organs for the source of organs for transplant procedures goes back into the 1960s, and there were some. Uh, pioneering studies done by a number of medical scientists that in retrospect are kind of suspect in terms of their of their ethics mm-hmm. but these experiments demonstrated that xenotransplantation is actually something that is you know quite is actually possible okay. and in those studies they were using chimpanzee organs or baboon organs 
Okay. And the the reason there is because the, these creatures are primates like mm-hmm. us, and so you would expect there to be a high level of compatibility. And in a couple of these instances, the patient lived for um, you know several weeks up to mm, okay. several months before they died. Right. You know, uh, and so there wasn't this immediate rejection of the organ. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem with using chimpanzees and baboons as a source of organs Mm -hmm. is, number one, because they are uh, primates Mm -hmm. like us, they're going to be much more likely to transmit infectious agents, viruses in particular, to to the human patient, which means not only is that patient potentially infected, you know, with a, a virus that would naturally be in a chimpanzee or a baboon, but then that patient could then infect other people, right, and it yeah. could be could, could create potentially a pandemic. In fact, well, we've had some stuff like some of the diseases we have or viruses are that sort of transmission. Correct? Right. Well, COVID nineteen is okay. from oh, bats, that is. Okay. All right. right? And and HIV mm-hmm. came, is originated as the simian right. immunodeficiency virus that hopped from right. a, a a great ape host to to a human host. Right. Uh, another problem, too, is animal welfare. Mm-hmm. You know, baboons and chimpanzees are, you know, s- have a, 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 a greater sense of awareness than perhaps right. any other animal. They also are endangered species. Right, yeah. Uh, they have, uh, they only have one offspring. Mm-hmm. The, the gestation time is really long. So practically speaking, they're gotcha. not very good. This is where pigs become really interesting mm-hmm. because... They their organs have a physiology that's comparable to mm-hmm. ours, that's compatible with ours, at least in a broad sense. Um, they have large litters. They're short right. gestation times, right? And and the the concern about animal welfare isn't as intense mm-hmm. for pigs as it would be for right. non-human primates. Are, are these organs? Physically similar in size to humans, because mm-hmm. humans tend. Well, I guess some pigs get quite large, but yeah, it seems yeah. to me there'd be a difference in size. But yeah, they they are mm-hmm. they're 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 similar in size. Now, really? okay. the the big issue is with pigs is a hyperacute rejection. Okay, right? Is that within before you can even get the organ fully attached to blood to the blood vessels, you the the body starts rejecting the organ. Uh, has an intense inflammatory response okay. because it's treating it as a foreign object. And people have under have studied the problem and have understood what's the basis for that. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that it's this sugar here, which is uh, galactosal alpha-1,3 galactose. It's a galactose disaccharide <laughs> that is a, a moiety in uh, polysaccharides that are on cell surfaces. Mm-hmm. And in in humans and in other non-human primates, the enzyme to make this disaccharide is not present in the genome. Okay. But in other, almost all other mammals it is, including pigs. And so this is the basis for this hyperacute rejection. And so... So the, so the human host detects this sugar, says that's a problem. Okay. Yep. Yep. It's, it's a foreign all object right. and it's, it's re- right. you know, rejected. The breakthrough came in, 2000, in the 2000s early 2000s when Dolly the sheep was cloned. Okay. Developing what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer uh, allows for animals to be cloned. Mm -hmm. And so the idea now is that you could take a pig and genetically engineer the pig so that it's no longer producing that particular disaccharide and then clone that that Mm -hmm. genetically engineered pig to create um, essentially you know, multiple clones of that pig that mm-hmm. could then in turn reproduce so, and so establish than, a line. Rather than suppressing the human immune system so that it doesn't attack it, you can just right. change the, the pig so that it's not producing it. That's fascinating. Right. And so the, um, the, the, the next big advance that took place was the development of CRISPR gene editing, which mm-hmm. now gives us the ability to do high precision gene editing right. relatively easily. Uh, and this has led to what is called the 10 gene edited pig, so that in addition to the gene that uh, encodes the the enzyme that makes uh, galactosal alpha one three mm-hmm. galactose, there are three other genes that are producing sugar moieties 
that also are contributing, but to a lesser degree, but right. are contributing yeah. to hyperacute rejection. So those are knocked out as well. And then there are actually six human genes that are added okay. uh, into the pig genome that help facilitate the human immune response to the transplanted organ, and then also are encoding human hormones mm -hmm. that organs would naturally produce. Right. And so this is the, the, the particular uh, pig that is now being used to study xenotransplantation right. by the teams at New York University, University of Alabama, Birmingham, and at University of Maryland. Uh, but there are, you know, still a number of, of technical challenges to this. In addition to hyperacute rejection, there's mm -hmm. also what's called uh, acute vascular rejection, okay. which will happen usually within several days uh, of the of the transplant. Mm -hmm. So if you get over the hyperacute rejection hurdle, now you have the acute vascular right. rejection to deal with. Uh, this can be dealt with through immunosuppressants. And then also what the scientists from New York University did is they attached a pig thymus mm -hmm. to the pig kidney. And the thymus is, is one of these organs that is part of the immune system that actually helps to mature immune cells. Okay. And so the thought is that if you have a, a pig thymus that is maturing immune cells in the human body, that this might make okay. the, the transplant more amenable, right. again, to a human environment. There's also chronic rejection, which mm -hmm. happens about weeks or months later. Nobody understands what causes this. So this is you know, sounds similar to the first mm -hmm. patient you were talking about had some sort of response like this, where it just for whatever reason it just right started failing. Right, and so the, again, but they seem to be able to by adjusting medication to reverse mm -hmm. that. So we're learning a lot about how to mm -hmm. how to uh, overcome the immunal you know the Im right. immunological barriers. Uh, there's also concern about mismatch in organ physiology. So, mm -hmm. for example, kidneys uh, serve a number of functions, right? One of them is to release hormones that trigger the production of red blood cells. This is erythropoietin that kidneys mm -hmm. release. They also release hormones that help to regulate blood pressure. And so if you have a, a pig kidney and it's releasing pig hormones, uh, how's right. that going to work in the human body? So that's part of the, the gene editing that's mm -hmm. going on. And then the, these uh, organs can also have pro create coagulation problems. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's concern about aging. Pigs live 15 years, right? So right, what does yeah. that do, you know, to the lifespan of the organ? And then, of course, there's concern about introducing viruses into the, into right, the patient. Yeah. Uh, and through screening processes, this is one way in which to, you know, kind of to m minimize this concern. Mm -hmm. The, the heart patient that, that died after the heart transplant at the University of Maryland, uh, people b discovered after the fact that there was a porcine cytomegalovirus in the, that patient's tissues. And mm -hmm. so they think maybe this virus actually contributed to the, the right, sudden okay. death of the patient. Not known, but, but, but anyway, right. that, that becomes an issue. And of course, you know, there are ethical concerns, animal welfare being one of them, uh, as you can imagine, uh, you know, concerns about really the patient uh, having enough under, understanding of these experimental procedures to really give mm -hmm. appropriate informed consent. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it, it does prolong the grief, right, grieving yeah. process in these experiments. So these are concerns that are being debated. All of this is manageable, though. Well, you know, the question I had that arises out of that, it's, you know, it's, you start talking about, hey, we might be able to use pig livers or pig kidneys to help human kidneys. Okay, great. That sounds like a good thing. But now you start, okay, you know, I'm just sitting here listening to the processes. Okay, yeah, you got to do that, but there's also this gene editing you got to do, and you got to introduce the thymus, and, and it's... It kind of has a Frankenstein -y feel to it after a while. <laughs> that, I mean, well motivated, good intention, but are we doing something bigger at this point than just trying to solve a human problem? Are we not? Might we not be introducing a bigger problem, if you will? And I'm curious. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that is the sixty-four million dollar question, mm -hmm. really. You know, and you know, so there's the the ethical, the obvious ethical issues. 
mm-hmm. that everybody would have regardless of worldview. But then f- as, from a Christian perspective, you know, the question is, should we be doing this stuff? Mm-hmm. Are, we, are we playing God? You know, and, you know, I tend to be pretty favorable to this work okay. uh, just simply because it's a, a means by which we can mitigate quite a bit of pain and suffering mm-hmm. in humans and, ex- you know, extend people's life expectancy uh, and improve the quality of life. So I think there, it, it, it's an idea that helps to promote human flourishing. If you think mm-hmm. of people bearing God's image, this is a you know a way to show dignity and respect. Right. You know to to those people that bear God's image. We all probably know someone who is eligible for an organ transplant, but is is waiting. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and those are very difficult and sad situations. Right, yeah. You know, and I think you know. Uh, we, God grants us dominion over the creation, mm-hmm. and so we are, you know, operating within that dominion. I think when we explore mm-hmm. things like the use of pig organs for for transplant procedures, yeah. you know, so I, I see, you know, good reasons from a Christian perspective to do this, mm-hmm. you know. But you know, there isn't very much an ick factor, and you know, you 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 wonder, you know, where the line is mm-hmm. sometimes with with these kind of emerging technologies. Well, it seems it does seem to have this kind of parallel with AI in my mm-hmm. assessment that there's in some sense you can argue AI is just a technology and in a very real sense you could argue this is it's a technology that mm-hmm. we're exploring and developing here. And at some point we've got to make sure that the people using it use it well. I mean, I don't think there's probably right. any medical technology that hasn't been used for both good and nefarious purposes at some point right. in time. And so it, it strikes me, this is just a powerful one. You right. know, the, the more powerful you get, the bigger the mm-hmm. bigger problems and damage you can do. But I guess I'm inclined to agree that this is a technology more than a ethical. Right. Uh, pursuing it is a technology problem. The way humans use it is going to be the ethical concerns. Yeah, so. yeah. And, you know, and, and I agree, and I think that you're, I, your recognition that there's a similarity between AI and, mm-hmm. and these emerging biotechnologies is really very perceptive and, and you know, can help us navigate the, mm-hmm. th- these scenarios. But, you know, it's interesting to me because, you know, when, when physicists discover something about the universe, engineers will take that insight and develop technology, and we don't tend to get too bent out of shape about that. Or right. if chemists discover a reaction we t- build chemical and mater- technologies <laughs> and material technologies from that. Right. And so in a sense, what we're seeing is the same thing playing out in biology. Hey, we're learning about biology. Now, can we use that to mm-hmm. develop technologies? But for some reason, when we start getting into the biological arena, you know, warning bells go off. And mm-hmm. not, not to say that that isn't justified, but... Yeah. You know, but but warning bells go off. You know. Well, you are starting to mess at some level with the essence of humanity, and right. when you're doing that. And what I mean, I don't know that a kidney is the essence of humanity, but I, it's just something I don't know that we've thought extensively enough about, so that we we have a clear ethical picture of how to pursue. But right. I, you're you're. Your parallels are interesting of why this technology raises such qualms in a desert. I, you know, part of my argument is this is why, as we're pursuing these technologies, we should want Christianity to be true mm. because it provides the ethical framework to do good and not harm. Mm-hmm. But it also, you know, it, it provides the character development that we're inclined to use it well instead of poorly. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, that's an interesting point because. You know, when when you think about um, you know the, the the ethical concerns, right? You know, we, we're concerned about you know human beings flourishing. We're mm-hmm. also concerned about patient rights and and the the rights mm-hmm. of the family. We're concerned about public health. These are all concerns that arise out of a Christian worldview naturally, That's right? True, yeah, we're, we're right. concerned about animal welfare. Mm-hmm. That that too is part of that 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 concern. Mm-hmm. We're we're concerned about you know. Are we going beyond what we should go beyond, right? Right. There, and, and there, that it's the idea that hey, as human beings, we're sinful. Mm-hmm. We lack wisdom, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and we are we're prone to making these kinds of, of mistakes. Christianity also promotes science. It promotes mm-hmm. technology. So Christianity give as you to your point is giving us 
all of those is is you know recognizing that we want to do what we can to mm -hmm. mitigate pain and suffering to promote human flourishing we want to care for the environment we want to care for animals mm -hmm. right there are bound there's boundaries we don't want to cross right you know so you know people often like to ask the question well should we play god and, and my answer is well we have no choice because mm -hmm. we're image bearers right and so our creativity and our in our you know and, and the ability to develop these technologies flows out of the mm -hmm. image of God. You know, we've been granted dominion over the creation. To, so to me, the problem isn't, you know, should we play God? The problem is, are we trying to take God's place? And I think yeah, that's okay. maybe a so, similar concern yeah. to, to what you're articulating. So playing God is we're built in God's image. We're going to do the things that God has equipped and designed and, and right. made us for. Replacing God is we're going to be the deciders of what's good, bad, right, or wrong instead of aligning that with what your interests are. Right. I, I think that's a good that's a good way of talking about it. That, that was clear. It helps provide clarity for me. Yeah. So. Well, you know, and this also highlights the fact too that um, you know it's hard anymore to work in science or medicine or engineering and not be concerned about ethical issues. Mm -hmm. I can remember. You know, when I was in grad school, nobody was concerned about ethics. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have the, the understanding and the technology to to really be that concerned as scientists with ethics. And, yeah. and if there was an ethical question, well, that's just something philosophers mm -hmm. can deal with. We don't need to be concerned about it as scientists. But now you have scientists developing insight or creating technologies that have such broad-ranging mm -hmm. <laughs> impact. And in right. and, and some of the... the the impact raises all kinds of ethical dilemmas. Right. Those people that are creating that technology have an obligation, I think, to think through the ethical issues, at least before they've done it, mm -hmm. if not, you know, in conjunction with developing that technology, you know, because well, they, it, it, they understand it better yeah. than anybody, right? Well, and it may very well be that, you know, that just with the the specialization that there's so much to know that, you know, we're used to, have, you know, the idea of a physicist and a biologist collaborating. Now it's the physicist, the biologist and the ethicist that are collaborating <laughs> Yeah, because these are, these are pretty weighty topics at the end of the day. So. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, it's interesting to me that, that the science faith conversation is moving beyond questions of origins mm -hmm. <laughs> and now is dealing with really, you know, questions about science and society. But to your point, there's power in the Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. And this is all the more reason why I think Christians need to consider doing, pursuing careers right. in AI or in biotechnology and why Christians really need to be well-versed in these emerging technologies and be willing to responsibly and thoughtfully uh, and vigorously engage our culture on these right. issues from a, a Christian worldview perspective. Because if we don't, then other worldviews are going to dictate mm -hmm. how the technology is used. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think that I think we're we've exhausted <laughs> that, that this topic. But anyway, um, just want to say thank you for joining us on this episode of Star Cells and God. Love to hear your thoughts, your comments. Please add them below. I always enjoy reading the, the comments that people offer as, uh, as they watch uh, this particular podcast. And hey, for fun, it might be interesting to know what superpower you would choose if you had that option. And then remember to, to like the video, uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe. Also, to use the notification button so that you are alerted when the next episode of Star Cells and God releases, which typically is on a Wednesday. Also, you can download Star Cells and God using your favorite podcasting app. And make sure you follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. And remember, the more that we know about science, the more we have reasons to believe. <laughs>